sometimes it takes years for people to come back to God. God never left them, but they've left God. It takes years for them to come to their senses to realize, I was well taken care of in my father's house. Now I'm out here and I'm leaning on the arm of the flesh, which has provided me nothing. The world will not help me. And here I'm remembering the grace and the goodness and the provision and everything that I had in my father's house. I am going to use three words from the English uh, out of Micah as a launching pad for my message. I'm going to take a little license today. So if you want to turn to Micah first, because you'll need to make a little small correction in Micah 7.14. Your King James reads, Micah 7.14, feed thy people. If you have a Bible like mine, there should be a little line beside there, and it says rule. Um, actually, if you are an NIV reader, the NIV translated it properly, shepherd your people. And I wrote the Hebrew on my tablet for you, so those of you who have studied Hebrew can see what that looks like and will recognize the words, perhaps. Shepherd your people. And so I'm, I'm just using those words for my message today, which won't be in Micah. We'll return there, God willing, next week. Um, but when I think of those words, shepherd your people, my mind goes to an image. And m many of you may have different images when you think about a shepherd, but mine is of a man, maybe wearing a little cap, definitely with some type of stick or crook in his hand, uh, possibly weathered from the sun, walking through a thick green valley, guiding his flock of sheep, shepherding them to their destination. And I, I use that in my mind as the way God leads us along. We are called sheep in the Bible. The way God leads us, Je Jesus is referred to as the good shepherd many times over. And we who make our way in and out of the valleys, life and living, and he watches over us, provides over us, cares for us as we go. There is that connection. I also see the shepherd as a fatherly image, protecting, providing, guiding, leading. Um, and if you want to take it into the biblical sense, as head of a family, giving spiritual counsel, leading in the word of God, etc. There are many scriptures um, that kind of declare that in one way or another. I wrote these down. I'm not going to turn to them. I'll read them to you. And some of these I've actually taken the liberty to uh, quote in the NIV, so they may not sound exactly like your King James. But um, Genesis 18, 19 says, For I have chosen him that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. Um, there's another one, Joshua, who had the mind of the Lord when he said, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. In fact, if you go back and read that whole verse, it basically says, you can do whatever you want, first book of Scott, but as for me and my household, that's uh, Joshua 24, 15, we will serve the Lord. And that is extremely important. I think that's one of the dimensions that not so much in this time, but in a generation coming up who's not being taught the responsibilities in parenting of bringing up a child in the word of God, in God's ways, these are important. Um, there are times, in this, particularly in this day and age, when if you mention the D word, discipline, you know, that's part of parenting. And that's also, again, you can't escape this. Part of the fatherhood of God is the discipline that he meets out, if you will. Um, there's many scriptures. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction, or another version says, or resent his rebuke. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, or for whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. So it's an unfortunate part of 
today's society, that lack of discipline. Uh, and I'm not just putting this on the father, it's both parents' responsibility. Uh, there's, there is something that has been commonly used, even people who don't know the Bible know the saying, spare the rod, spoil the child. And that's quite unfortunate. You can see how that is affecting future generations who, um, again, who am I to say? There are people who have different styles of parenting and what they do, but God's pattern, God's template, his fatherly ways with his children, us, is at times too disciplined, at times too have to do the things that I'm sure as our Heavenly Father, He does th these things, discipline, because it's needed. Uh, I think it's, it's terrible when we look at discipline is interpreted in this day and age as punishment instead of what it is, corrective design by God. And so it's kind of important. This all applies here. If you're interested in the thought process to this message, because this is all um, introduction, if you will. The message will come a little bit later. But there are some interesting passages in the Bible. Uh, the last verse of the Old Testament, book of Malachi, says, for example, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Most people don't know that the last book of the Old Testament ends with a curse, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. But what that is referring to, you've got to read what, what comes before it. I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, which I'm sure dovetails into Revelation 11.3 and the two witnesses whom I believe one of them will be Elijah. And the idea here for a future time is that there will be a restoration of in of sorts of the order of the way things are supposed to be. Would, you, would anybody here argue with me that things seem to be completely out of whack with our society? No arguments there, right? So you can see how this is important. But it's said there for a reason, because you've got a passage. And I'll, don't turn. I'll just read it to you out of Isaiah. It's Isaiah 1, 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nursed and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Now, that's speaking of a particular people, but it speaks now of society basically as a whole, rebellious in nature, not wanting to listen to our Heavenly Father. And again, I'm, I'm repeating this over and over again because the message is basically uh, about the fatherhood, the, our Heavenly Father, His shepherding in our lives. So... I want us today to look at a familiar passage that represents all dimensions of this day, Father's Day, um, that will help me to communicate to those who basically may not know exactly how amazing our Heavenly Father is and also kind of a little bit of a way to say to those who are struggling with the how-tos of dealing with their own lives, whether it's your own failure or whether it's your children's failure, whatever it is, this is a very good compass to help us kind of find our way back to some tenderness and some kindness and some love that I think we all desperately need. So if you will, turn with me to Luke 15. And for those that are not familiar, you know, Jesus, while you're turning to Luke 15, Jesus spoke much himself about being the true shepherd, the gateway, the only door for the sheep. That's us. He's the shepherd. So you've got all these beautiful pictures, if you will, that support everything I've just said. I've just said it in a colloquial way. And the sad part is that I think there are a lot of folks in the sound of my voice today, who because they may not know the love of our Heavenly Father can't really appreciate the love of their earthly father. Let me ask a question before I get into this because there's just one more thing I want to ask. 
uh, I'm only asking those people who are 40 and older. How many 40 and older? Raise your hand. That's almost all of us here. <laughs> Can you remember back when you were a child to every time your parents rushed you to the hospital with some unknown sickness. Can you remember that? Because I cannot. Can you remember how there were clothes on your back all the time? Somehow they just magically appeared, right? Or how there was always food set before you as a child. See, these are the things that children don't tend to understand until they become adult children, right? You get old enough to realize somebody sacrificed. See, right now, a child or a young adult, say, I'm going to put the, the ceiling on this to about 25. So from 0 to 25, have probably no recollection or very little of what your parents did for you, how they ran, how they took you, when it was a doctor's, when it was a... a football or a soccer practice or your dance rehearsal, whatever it was, the parents were always there, mother or father. And it's so tragic that all of that window of our life where there is sacrifice being made, we can't really see it. We're just dumb kids. And you get old enough to realize that no matter how good or bad you view your parents, somebody sacrificed for you for you to have, for you to be able to function in life. And you can say, well, I didn't come from a rich family and I got hand-me-downs. Well, somebody made sure you got the darn hand-me-downs instead of them going in the trash. These are the things we don't think of when we think of our parents. And specifically now I speak about fathers. Fathers get a bad rap. You know, it's, usually it's the mom seen as the cook and the cleaner and the doer in the home, but that's all changed. And now dads do that work as well. And it's not a choice. So what I'm saying to you is it's, it really is vitally important for us to reflect, not just for one day, by the way. You know, most people don't even know the history of Father's Day, of the birth of Father's Day. There was Mother's Day first, and that was uh, celebrated kind of as a reconciliation at the end of the Civil War, I believe, to gather mothers and basically to grieve over uh, lost sons and whatnot, and it was a time of kind of reconciliation. And Father's Day was birthed out of that years, years, years later, much later, and actually was rejected by most men, thinking that it was an attempt to emasculate men. Well, I look at this as a day, any day, for mother or father, but today is Father's Day to honor our fathers, whether they are here with us or not. So, Luke 15, and Luke 15, the whole passage, the whole opening of this passage, uh, and where I'm going, obviously, is to the prodigal son, but I want to show you something at the opening of this, because it dovetails into the whole chapter. Um, I brought both Bibles, because I was going to read from John, and a good chunk of the page in John is gone. <laughs> I didn't eat it. Taste and see that the word is good. No, I didn't eat it. Uh, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And then Jesus goes on to speak the parable regarding the lost coin. Uh, actually, it's the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the lost son, if you will. And there's something there right at the beginning that I just want to draw your attention to. And that is that the son here, Jesus, chose, he was sent into the world and he chose to speak to those in the world. What's unfortunate is that he even said, if you were of the world, the world would love its own, but you're not of the world, I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Here, the criticism of him gathering to speak to those that would hear him and I want you to think about this. The love of the son to uh, undergo the all, on all fronts, not just from this passage, but from everything we know, the humiliation, the, the murmuring, the rejection, 
to still have a mission to carry out whether or not people would gather and it would be popular. And again, this kind of dovetails back to doing the right thing, both in the pulpit and in the home. And then he starts off with this, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto him his living. Now, I've taught out of this passage many, many times. But I kind of have to go along with my notes because I made notes this time that are just a little bit different uh, in their message than in previous messages. So the first thing I want you to see is that he asked the father for his portion of the goods, his part of his inheritance, if you will. The um, NIV says, give me the share of my estate. Now, there's something very subtle right there because it would be improper for a child, we're talking about the biblical ways, for a child to ask for this unless it was tantamount to saying, I wish you were dead because that's the way the child would get the part of the estate. So I want you to put a little bit of a spin on the way this son might have seen the father. And we know here that a certain man, which is speaking of God, the father had two sons. So it's kind of interesting. The younger one says, give me my portion of my inheritance. And I don't want to wait for it. I want it now. And it says, not many days after the younger son gathered all together, he took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Now, there are things in here that I think we should just stop and pay attention to. It's as if this child, this son, were saying, I wish you were dead, give me my money, and then takes off to go as far away from the father as he can. And I don't know what it is and why this is so. Not every child does this, but there are some where that's the whole driving force. As soon as they can be distanced and they have some resentment or whatever it is under their skin, and I can only think, because I'm putting a little bit of flesh and blood on this, when it says he wasted his substance with riotous living. Empty. Now let me ask you something for you who may be looking at this today and you might be saying, well, okay, how does this apply? How many of you spent, we used to sing a song here, Wasted Years, how many of you spent years that could have been redeemed serving God and doing more profitable things, right? So don't look at this and think, oh, this is just a, a little sweet little parable that we know of because it represents, it does represent a people. It represents two types of people. You know, there's two sons, one that stayed in the home who was absolutely blind in lack of understanding about the father in the respect that he was religious without connection to the father, if you want to put it that way. This represents two types of people. And also the son that basically said, give me, and I want to get out of here as fast as I can. Someone who has no regard for the things of God, nor the house of God. So put that in perspective. I think we all have been there at some point. But it says here that he spent everything. And read into that. Once you've spent everything, what are you? Empty. You have nothing. Now I wonder, don't raise your hand, please. I don't want anyone to raise their hand. But I wonder if anyone can relate to this, where you basically, maybe in your younger years, you doubled down and you basically blew everything that you had on something that you knew unequivocally was fruitless. And then you end up with nothing scratching your head, looking around for someone to help you, for some leg up, and it's not there. Or you could put it this way, did you waste even the breath of your lungs or your time in something? So it goes on to say when he had spent all, there's this kind of, it's a downward spiral. When he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. 
Well, keep in mind that if he wasted all of his substance, he would have already been in want. He would have already been lacking. And then add to it a famine. Now, I want to make one quick application to something that is not here, but it will make sense to you. I think this parable also could be applicable to our nation with people squandering what God-given rights and freedoms have been given to them to just live for today. And you can do that. That's your prerogative. Equally, when it says there was a mighty famine in the land, I'm sure it was a famine for food. We have a famine in this land for the Word of God. And people are starving and don't even know it. Isn't that amazing? And he began to be in want, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Again, another, it's kind of a spiral going down. You know, start in the father's house, and here we keep going down and down and deeper and deeper, joining himself to a certain, to a citizen of that country. It's almost like misery loves company, or, you know, I'm out here, I might as well, you can rationalize, I might as well just go and do this thing because it's there instead of being rational, sensible, which comes later, by the way. And I think this is also a picture of having to absolutely hit rock bottom. Now let me flip this the other way. How many parents here who have children who look like this prodigal son? They haven't returned yet, but they are completely disinterested in God and God's word and God's ways. In fact, they resent you for your preference and your worship. Now, I wouldn't say raise your hand because I don't think anybody wants to really acknowledge that is in their life, but that, by the way, is all around us. And then there are equally, by the way, I've told you the story of the gal who she passed away a couple of years ago, but I told you the story of the gal who worked here and worked for many, many years. She was here for a long time on staff. And one day she said she wanted to go out and live. She felt like she'd been in the ministry for so long that she was missing life out in the world. And she did. She went out into the world. She was, while she was here, um, she was dedicated serving. I, I, listen, I don't care what you do in your private life. That's your business. But she went out, left the ministry, went out. She met a man who was vehemently opposed to this ministry. It's always like that. You always get somebody who can manage to turn the other person and sour them. You know what the heart does. All you got to do is look at Solomon, turned away by the idols of his pagan wives. So she didn't quite get turned away, but for a time she just kind of disappeared and resurfaced a few years later, came back, she, her body was riddled with cancer, and she asked that she spend her last days, if she could, working for the ministry back in her former position. And I had no problem taking her back. I told you that's the lady some of you might remember her, whose smile could light up a room. But it gives a really clear understanding to me, almost like where the rubber meets the road, because I've seen it where people say, there's got to be something more. Well, if you think there is, go find it, but I'll guarantee you there's not. In fact, what you find out there is going to be more uh, mirage and not substance. The substance is what you can't see from this word, what you can't touch from this word. That's the substance, if that makes any sense to you. So clearly, there's a double and triple whammy, all right? Goes into a far country, far away from his father's house, wasted everything that he had with riotous living. And when he'd spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land. He began to be in want, joined himself to a citizen of that country, and sent him into his fields to feed swine. Now, it's a clear illusion, by the way, of these two, two people that one of these represents undoubtedly the uh, children of Israel. I'm not going to say the Jewish people, but those chosen of God who basically rejected him. And it's, there's a reason why it says that he sent him into the fields to feed swine, because if you were professing that faith, those animals are unclean. You wouldn't be caught dead near them. You won't eat them, won't tend them, 
won't do anything around them. So it's almost like here we have this, you know, from the top, from the father's house, and this giant slide all the way down. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And I want to stop right there, because that is the place that most people find themselves when they figure out going out into the world. You'll find, you know, you can say what you want, but especially in this day and age, it is the most cutthroat, unbelievable, ask for help. And because there are so many fakers asking for help, now, I've told you the story many times about the gal I used to see. She used to panhandle in Pasadena, right there on Lake and Green. And I used to see her every day on the corner wearing a big tufted jacket, carrying, pulling one of those aluminum carts with bags and bags and bags. And then one day, many years ago, I went into Starbucks. I don't go there anymore, but I went into Starbucks. Not that I don't drink coffee, I just don't go to Starbucks. <laughs> uh, I speak with my pocketbook, how's that? Uh, I was standing in line, and she was in front of me. And she, fumbling around in her pocket, pulled out a wad of money. And on the top of it was a platinum American Express card. She was panhandling, by the way. So when I say there's a lot of fakery out there, and you don't know who's what, when it says this here that no man gave unto him, that's like in this day and age. You want to do a good deed and you want to help other people, but how do you know who to help and who's what? And even more tragic is that you would think in his day, in this day and age from the Bible, somebody would be ready to help him, ready to step up to the plate. Here, here's some food, here's some clothes, come stay with me. No one would help him. And I believe, by the way, this was all God's design, because this is when he came to himself, when he came back to his sanity. How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? He thought, when he came back to his sanity, he thought of his father's house, and he thought of the goodness in his father's house, and the provision in his father's house, and the care in his father's house. And clearly, this is a very straightforward. I don't think this parable needs too much explaining. The thing is that a lot of times it takes so long for many people to come to that conclusion, to go back to the Father's house. And sometimes years pass before people come to their senses. Now put this in where the rubber meets the road. Sometimes it takes years for people to come back to God. God never left them, but they've left God. It takes years for them to come to their senses to realize, I was well taken care of in my father's house. Now I'm out here, and I'm leaning on the arm of the flesh, which has provided me nothing. The world will not help me. And here I'm remembering the grace and the goodness and the provision and everything that I had in my father's house. And I wonder how many... Now flip this back the other way. How many children are out there today who have distanced themselves from their parents, who are maybe possibly, quite possibly, maybe, listening to this message, maybe, by God's grace, thinking, maybe there was some better times under my parents' roof or under my father's roof. I'm not just speaking of the house of God. I'm speaking of your own household. Maybe there are people out there that are thinking that, reflecting that. And I'm going to tell you something. Don't wait to turn back. That's the problem. A lot of times our pride keeps us from turning back and returning. We become so proud. We say, oh, I, I, I could never do that. That's just someone who's puffed up in pride instead of humbling yourself, coming to your senses. And there's one other step that must happen here for things to be right. Because it says when he came to his senses, there's a kind of a, a methodology here. He says, I will arise. So it was in his mind already. And I go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And I want you to see the right mindset, which you'll have to forgive me because I have so many directions this message could go in. The first one that comes to my mind when I think about this son turning back as he thought about it. 
He was first thinking about reminiscing maybe about the good old days in his father's house. And then he put those thoughts into action. I will arise and I will go and this is what I'm going to do. And guess what? He carried through with it. It's not as though he thought it. A lot of times we do that. We think about something and then we don't do it. How many of you know that's true? You think about it, you don't do it. You don't go through, you don't carry through with the action. But the crucial thing here is what he says. I have sinned against heaven and before thee. With the right attitude. This is why I said to you, it's so difficult in this day and age to reach people because everybody wants a trophy just for showing up. No one wants to be disciplined. No one even wants to discipline themselves. You know, all you have to do is look at a lot of these folks on social media who are influencers, whatever that means, and recognize that maybe some of the advice in whatever areas they try to give or do to other people may be their luck, but most of what's needed in life to succeed. You want to be a good student in school? Discipline to study. You want to be a good child to your parents? You have to receive discipline. I mean, there's so many ways to look at this. So it's so, so unfortunate that the attitude, the starting point, must be there. You can't just show up and say, OK, I'm back now. Take me as I am. It doesn't work that way. So his attitude was right. And to show you how deeply his attitude was right, not only did he say, I've sinned against heaven and before thee, but he said, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. I'm, I don't deserve to be called son to you anymore. I wonder, don't think of this as something you've read many times that you know like the back of your hand. I wonder if any of this hits close to home with any of you on any level. And maybe it's the other way around. Maybe for some of us standing here today or sitting here today, it's the fact that you weren't really too good to your parents and had a bad attitude towards them. I've told you, my relationship with both my mother and my father was not that stellar. And it was only later in life as I came into a little bit more wisdom and maturity that I forgave, I told you, forgave my father. I never got the opportunity to express that, but I forgave him because he tried and did the best he could. That doesn't mean that it was great. In fact, if I look back, I think there, there were a lot of things lacking, but he did the best that he was able to do. You can't fault somebody for that. And in fact, as a child, I was angry until, as I said, I came to an age to realize that there were sacrifices made for me, although I didn't see them and I didn't know about them. How could I? How could any of you? But you know that they were done for you regardless. And maybe I'll say it this way. There's no roadmap to be a perfect parent. There's no roadmap to be a perfect child because neither one of those exists. But I realized I had to forgive because the reality is that he did the best he could. And I recognize that today. In fact, I've tried to tell many people, you have to look at what the person is given in their life and how they will, what they will do with what they have. And if they have little, what they do with the little. But you cannot fault someone for trying. And as I said, in my coming to my senses, I had to completely forgive and realize that maybe it was my attitude that was wrong. And I'm sure there's probably a lot more like me out there who have the same thing. So what I want you to look at here is the fact that not only did he have a right attitude, it was in his mind to go back to repent, because that's what that is when he says, I've sinned. Uh, by the way, do you see him going to a priest first to confess? <laughs> Just thought I'd add that in there for those diehards who will not give that up. And the attitude, because of all that I've done, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just make me like one of your workers. It would be enough for me to be under your roof and close to you. I would understand if you never took me back. 
but I want you to see the Father's love. It says, and he arose, the son, came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. And this is what I want you to think of. As I started with that, he will shepherd his people. And this is very much like the shepherdhood of Christ and the fatherly love that we receive because it says he was still a great way off when the father saw him. It's as though the father was anticipating, looking far in the distance, maybe constantly looking for him to surface sometime, somewhere at some point, sees him in the distance. And it says he had compassion and ran, fell on his neck and kissed him. And I want, just want you to stop right there because we have this uh, modernized version. I want you to think of the picture of in this particular day when this book was written, what would have happened. Men in those days wore something that looks like a skirt with a tunic underneath. Very difficult to run, by the way. So I imagine him gathering up all the cloth, picking it up, and running. The imagery is kind of staggering, because if you think about it, it also would be not very fatherly-like in that respect. But it says he saw him, had compassion, ran, fell on his neck, and kissed him. You don't hear any lecture from the father. You darn rat, you son of a gun. You don't hear that. In fact, there's, it's interesting, there's silence. There is no anger. This is what I, I now want us to see, the father side of God. Silent, but he runs, takes a hold of his neck, kisses him. And the son said unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven. Now he's articulating it. And in thy sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And I want you to think about this too. He didn't say to the son, now look, you go wash up. You go get cleaned up. You come back here and confess your sins in front of everybody. I can't help it. I got to take those digs. <laughs> he brought forth the best robe, the best of the best, and just put it on him. Now, I, I also want you to think of this. It doesn't say anywhere that the son had an opportunity to wash up, shave, and shower. So he probably was stinky and dirty. And that's the way we come before God, stinky and dirty. And God says, put the best robe on him or her. Come as you are. That's the love of the Father. See, I don't think people have a right view of our Heavenly Father. I don't think people really truly understand. I think there's more people out there that caricature that God's some, uh, as it's been said here, cosmic killjoy sitting on His heavenly throne just waiting to zap people with a thunderbolt because they've thought something bad or done something sinful. Well, then, if that's the case, we should all be struck dead. But... What I love about this, by the way, is you really get to see the Father's heart. Not only did he say, bring forth the best robe and put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, provide, clothe, clothe him, provide for him. The ring, by the way, represents being either part, put back as part of the family as a, a sense of, if you want to call it, whether it's the imagery of like a wedding ring of a reunion, but it is that which demonstrates this is not just word service from the Father. These are actions to show you are received in the Beloved. You are welcome back. You are forgiven. And I wish, if anything, that this could be lifted up clearly for people to see. It will not come, by the way, by appearing and on our part being silent. That's the missing ingredient that not just this generation, but every generation grapples with. I told you when I worked in the prisons and jails, the thing that I would chronically get, it was a chronic problem and a chronic subject that was always discussed. Not how to receive forgiveness from God, because most who had heard the gospel preached understood 
the dimension of God's forgiveness, but how to receive it in the heart to get rid of guilt and shame, or better yet, how to, the, the expression how to forgive oneself, which I'm not really sure that that's a true statement. One must recognize your state before God. And as I said, it's the hardest thing that people grapple with. How can you show up and expect someone to receive you without articulating? And this is as plain as day. God's not wanting us to grovel and to crawl on our knees and to flagellate ourselves. He's wanting us to speak a truth that he himself in his heart knows of us. I'm a sinner. I've sinned. Forgive me. And not this lip service stuff that, you know, a lot of people like to toss out. Genuine. And I said, you can tell this is genuine because on the part of the sun, there's just as many steps that go down, that sink to rock bottom, as there are to go up. He had to come to his senses. He had to think about his father's house, the goodness that was in his father's house. He had to basically, I will get up and I will go, and then had to actually carry through with getting up and going, and then articulating the words to the Father, not to anybody else, to the Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, no more worthy to be called thy son. And then you have not just being clothed with the best robe and ring and shoes, he says, bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again, he was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. The father's haste towards the son, the father's kiss, the father's silence to the son's confession, and I say godly silence, the prodigal's reception, the condition, still a great way off, all of these things, put them in line and ask yourself a question, whether you view yourself perhaps as the son, as someone who's wandered away, and there are plenty of those, whether you view yourself as a, an earthly father grappling with what goes on under your roof. And I can tell you, I don't know all the dilemmas that go on, but I can definitely, just from the small things that I know of the pulse of society, what one would have to counteract and deal with simply for a child of age to go to school and what they might bring home in terms of what goes into the heads and the minds of young people. Best robe, best everything. The father's gift to the son, if you want to put it in a nutshell, the garment of salvation. Give him the best robe, garment of salvation, the robe of his righteousness. And, of course, let us eat, let us be merry. If you have read this passage, you know it says, for each time that... A sinner repents, it says, so I say unto you, like, likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. And that ties into the two sons. One had done nothing wrong. You think about it, he actually did. And one wandered far away. And the whole premise here, you read again, if you go back just a little bit into verse 10, likewise I say unto you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. So this is kind of the capstone to all this. And I'm not sure if this will help children or fathers today, but it is my prayer that people look to this passage and understand we have a lot of anger in our society. We have Angry children, we've got, ang we've got anger everywhere. I don't see one drop of anger in this passage. And I'm not telling you, let things slide, turn the other cheek, it's all good. There are consequences. What does the Bible say for the wages of sin is what? Death. Death, exactly. So I'm not saying this is without consequence and we should just kind of wink, it's all good. Sin, wink, wink, it's all good. Because that's what basically society has done. It said, oh, that's, you know, all this stuff is... Uh, really, it's not really sinful, it's okay, and isn't that the voice of the serpent in the garden? But what I want us to see is the importance of understanding the Father's heart in his tender care for each and every one of us, because for each and every one of us, we've had a moment like the prodigal, 
It may have lasted for five minutes, some of you for five years, some of you for 50 years. Some people write me and they say, why did it take me so long? In fact, I was reading a message from someone who is 78 and just recently started following the teaching and reading the Bible and said, why did it take me so long? And all I could think of while I was reading the message is better late than never, even at 78. You know, if God wants you, God will keep that tug, that nudging, until you answer. Now, you see the other side of this. The elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing, called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. He said to him, Thy brother has come. And thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. And listen to what the, we'll call him the righteous brother's reaction was. Angry and would not go in. Therefore came his, his father came out and treated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time that thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. That's the other side of the equation. The religious people who can't get over themselves, the religious people who think, I've never sinned. That's basically, by the way, when he says, I've never transgressed, trust me, there is no person who's ever not transgressed anything in this life except for Jesus Christ. So when he says that, I, I've never broken any of your commandments, I'm, 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 I'm righteous. Well, uh, verse 28 says, and he was angry. And we're now looking at Christ telling a parable. And if you know what Christ said, he said that being angry is as good as what? Murder. Murder. Exactly. I never did anything. Isn't that interesting how we can be blind both to the Father's love to go after the lost and to our own hypocrisy? These are the other things. Because there'll be people listening to me say, well, I've never been like the prodigal. I never wandered away. Well, maybe you're like the other son. And I've met people like this. I was traveling in an airport, and a man walked up to me. This is probably at least 10 years ago. And he said, my wife and my children are over there, and I want to tell you how good I, I love your teaching ministry. And proceeded to tell me he's like a perfectionist. You know, how you know, well, we don't sin, and, you know, we, we're, we're, and I'm, I'm listening to him, and I'm, all I could think of is the... the that crazy UFO music, you know, playing in my head because it's like this guy standing in front of me saying, I don't sin, and I'm thinking to myself, what, what planet are you from? Because you're certainly not from this planet here, and I'll leave that one alone because that's just not possible. But here's, there are people like that. They're blind to their own hypocrisy. They cannot see, and furthermore, they have disdain on anyone who would try to help the lost. You remember I told you many years ago how many people, when I was going into uh, the penitentiaries, the jails, prisons, how many people actually left the ministry and say, well, Dr. Scott never did that. Well, Dr. Scott had his ministry and I had mine, and that was a calling that the Lord gave me at that particular time in my life. And if you had any clue that maybe I didn't go into the prisons to minister to the people, maybe... God was teaching me a lesson because I can tell you it was God's design for me to go in there. God opened the door and God closed the door. It wasn't like uh, I didn't say, oh, I think one day I'm going to go and minister to these people in prison. God opened that door specifically for a purpose, and I'll tell you. As a young minister, really just kind of cutting my teeth, it was the greatest challenge to go into those facilities where you had a thousand different distractions going on. You'll vouch for that. We were in one unit where it opened bathrooms and showers in a men's dorm. And I had to deliver my message with my back towards the toilet and the showers because I didn't, trust me, I didn't want to be looking in that direction. Unfortunately, 
you couldn't stop the odors. And you can go wherever you want with that. The distraction of toilets flushing, of showers, of pill call, of announcements, of lockdowns, of uh, people who scratching and moving all over the place, and some who had mental health issues with, would blurt out some interesting commentaries. <laughs> some of you who travel with me know the story, but I won't go into that. When I'm saying to you, God opened that door for a purpose, and I'm not going to say that it, I'm not going to say self-centeredly it was all for me because I know that it was for a purpose, but that purpose probably had a twofold reason in it. One was for the inmates. The other was for me. God was showing me and teaching me and helping me to become a better minister, and I'm still growing into that position of becoming a better minister. But people left the ministry because I was basically going after the lost. And you can't see that right here, the one that stayed in the house, that never sinned, that was so good, that said, well, I, why would you do, I'm, I'm mad, why, why wouldn't you do that for me? You can see the parallel. So it all depends on what side of this you're looking at. He was angry, would not go in, therefore came his father out, entreated him, and he answering said, to his father, lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. He didn't say that I might make merry with you. Notice that. There's a little, also a little sidebar right there. With my friends. But as soon as thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. That is jealousy, a bad attitude, a lack of understanding. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. All I can tell you today in looking at, there's so many different moving parts to this parable and to this message. The care of our Heavenly Father which, by the way, should transcend down to our earthly fathers and does. And to see that it's no slim task to have, whether you have a wandering child or one that's self-righteous, neither one could be easy to deal with. But I want you to see the, ca the care and the compassion and the kindness of the way our Heavenly Father dealt with the matter and equally for those kids listening today who might not think anything of honoring your father today, I want you to think about it this way, and I'll go back to what I said earlier. There comes a time in every child's life, that age of emancipation, the pushing away, the I'm an adult now, leave me alone, that eventually gives way to understanding, recognition, forgiveness. And no matter how you paint this picture, the sacrifices that are made for children, which, by the way, will seldom, if ever, be remembered, especially those early years that a child can't remember, it's important for us and especially for this country where it seems like no one has any respect for anything anymore to, go, to get back to a concept of respecting parents, of understanding it is not easy. Now, most parents choose to have a child. Not all choose, some have a child and they have a child, right? That's all, that's all you need to know about that. This is, that's the birds and the bees lesson for today. But for those who desire to have a child, you think first that little bundle of joy that will be become. But before it becomes able to walk and talk, it is completely dependent upon you, not just for the things that are obvious, but for also the things that are not so obvious. This is why I said you train up a child in the way that he should go. I do believe this, that the, the scripture says, and he shall not soon depart. Oh no, I'll tell you what happens. Most children will depart and they come back. 
These are the habits that are ingrained in a child from early on that are in the deepest, embedded in the deepest part of the mind that only later in life may come out or are brought out by something, whether it's a crisis, whatever it is, it doesn't matter, whether, whether it's God's provenient grace at work. The concept here is God in his fatherly love shows each and every one of us by his care, by his provision, by his kindness, by his forgiveness, and I could keep going on all these things of what it looks like. Now, can we, can we attain that? Can we be that? No, but we can look towards that and see that as a template and understand God has given us a footprint. I quoted to you at the beginning that passage out of Genesis, out of Genesis 18 or out of Joshua 24, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. It begins there. It begins with parents having at least a godly understanding of this book, not rules, not laws, not regulations, an understanding of who God is. And that love of God should fill the home and the minds of all that are in it. So my prayer for this Father's Day, for those people who are grappling, whether you are someone's child and there is a disconnect, or whether your father, your father's here, or maybe your father is passed on, maybe you don't have the best relationship with your father, I want you to remember one thing. You yourself are not perfect, neither am I. Your parents cannot be perfect, but they have done the best they could. It is a day, one day, and I don't say take this day and do thus and so. I say all year round recognize the sacrifices that have been made and recognize that although not perfect, especially for those who grapple with this, you've tried your best, you've done your best for your children. And don't let anybody say, well, you know, a better parent and lecture you about being a better parent. As I said, the difficulty is there is no road map. And you have to work this out with God. The good thing is he has not left us without something to follow, without something to see. There are plenty of godly fathers in this book that show the way, that paint the way that we ought to go, that we ought to look towards at least and reflect on, meditate, and think about. So for today, my one prayer is this. Those prodigal children, don't be so rough on your parents to think that somehow you're perfect and they're flawed. That's being a hypocrite. And to those fathers out there, sometimes kids can be unlovable, just like sometimes you may be unlovable. But understand, it takes two to make that balance, but it takes the adult to take the first step with God to show the child the ways of our Heavenly Father's love, how He loves us, takes us, accepts us, even when we blunder up real bad. He still is our loving Heavenly Father. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com. Dot com.